buying the right MacBook Air should be so straightforward, but there are a couple of points that I think you need to know about before you go and buy your MacBook Air to make sure you're buying the right Mac for you and your particular user case. I'm David, and this is D-Talking MacBook Air. I make no apology for the fact, and I'm not embarrassed to admit that I've got a massive affinity for the MacBook Air. Why? Well, because it was the first Mac I ever bought. It's one of the Macs on the shelf behind me. And I guess you could say from buying that Mac led to me starting this channel all these years later. And since that original one, I've had an M1, an M2, and an M3 MacBook Air. But the MacBook Air had almost been, it was almost as if it had been waiting for Apple Silicon to come along. It was the perfect partnership. Of course, we all know about the ridiculous power that Apple Silicon brings to these chips. And by putting that inside the MacBook Air, it means that the airs we're carrying around with us now are ridiculously powerful, super versatile, but still lightweight and portable. You could almost think of it like a, a MacBook Pro Lite now, but it does fall under that banner of where you shouldn't try to make the MacBook Air into something it's not. And I'll cover that towards the end of the video with my kind of buyer's advice on it. But the MacBook Air this year, wasn't tempting enough. The M4 MacBook Air wasn't tempting enough for me to go and replace my M3 MacBook Air with it. So there was only one meaningful improvement, memory bandwidth, and I'll cover that in a second. So for once, I actually let my head rule my heart. I didn't upgrade this year. But the MacBook Air feels every inch a Mac. Now, I, I don't know if it's the affinity I've got because it was my first Mac, but it's the Mac that I still enjoy getting out of the box unboxing for the first time and setting up. It just has got something magical to it. I don't know why. And it's the Mac that would remain at the top of the list of the Macs that I would suggest most people go and buy because it is that good. It really is. It's such a good Mac. Starting at a thousand pounds or 900 pounds if you can get a student discount, it's one of Apple's nearly bargains. But remember, as long as you don't try to make it into something that it's not. For that money, for a thousand pounds, you get a 10 core CPU, an eight core GPU, you get 16 gigs of memory and 256 gigs of storage. You get MagSafe, you get two Thunderbolt 4 ports, you get a retina display and a 12 megapixel front facing camera as well. And I mentioned they're quick and that the memory bandwidth was the one thing that almost tempted me to swap my MacBook Air. And the memory bandwidth now is 120 gigs of memory bandwidth, which on a MacBook Air is crazy good. Now the IO, although it's limited, it's quality IO. And it's one of those instances where the quality matters more than necessarily the number. Those Thunderbolt 4 ports offer you 40 gigs of data transfer speed, which means that you can meaningfully work from external SSDs. And that's important because it means you haven't got to spend a fortune on buying Apple's internal storage. And we know how much that costs. Just buy yourself a Thunderbolt 4 enclosure, and then you've got something that's modular and more flexible as well. You can take that SSD with you, and work on other Macs. It's exactly how I work here in the studio. It's exactly how I'm recording this video now. An external SSD will be traveling with me from the studio to home later on today. The keyboard is super comfortable to use, possibly more comfortable than a MacBook Pro because it's slimmer and sits a little bit closer to the desk. The trackpad is really tactile, really clicky. It's really firm and easy to use. The speakers, well, actually they're so good. You have to remind yourself how tiny they are. They produce really good sound. Apple's audio engineers did a great job on the speakers and the battery, as you know, well, that's going to go on pretty much forever. It'll certainly get you through a, a day's of de a day long decent working conditions. Now, the only time it let me down this year was when I asked it to do something that really it wasn't fair to me, to, for, me for me to ask of my MacBook Air. Mine is only the basic 256 16 gig model. I was away on location shooting. Uh, I was shooting in ProRes RAW, working from an external SSD, and Final Cut just stuttered, stuttered to a halt. I was barely able to edit it. I wanted to put together a basic timeline. It was a 12, 13 minute odd video, and it struggled. But as I say, it is a 16 gig MacBook Air. I didn't ever buy it with the intention of doing that kind of work on it. I've got other Macs that I generally would do that on. It's purely because it was the only Mac I had with me on that particular location shoot. So it wasn't really the fault of the MacBook Air, it was more to do with me. And that's what comes down to getting the specs right, which we're going to be covering right towards the end of this video. Now, the biggest rival, oddly, to the MacBook Air would probably be the M4 iPad Pro that I spoke about last week. They're very similar in size, they're very similar in weight, they're very similar in what they can deliver and what you'd want to do with them. But perhaps, just perhaps like me, at your core, at your heart, you prefer working on a Mac, you're a Mac OS user. And if that's the case, honestly, you probably would need to look no further than a MacBook Air if you need 
a portable Mac. They are so good. Using it again this last couple of weeks, I can't, it's just reminded me how good they are. So if I was going to suggest to you what MacBook Air you should buy, well, it falls into two camps, two very distinct and easy camps for me to, to describe to you. If you know that you're going to be a lightweight user, this is just a portal Mac to use on trains, planes, and all you're going to be doing is surfing the web, writing and answering emails, maybe working on some pages and notes, documents, that kind of thing. Go for that base, 1,000 pound, 256 gigs of storage, 16 gigs of RAM. It will serve you right all day long. But this is where you need to make a choice. If you think that your workflow is going to be a little bit heavier than that, and you can see this Mac lasting you for years to come, and your workflow getting a bit more intense, I've got a couple of suggestions for you. First of all, as much as I wouldn't have normally said this, I think because it being a portal Mac, I think you should jump up from the 13 inch to the 15 inch display. And when you do that, jump up from the basic 256 gigs of storage up to 512 gigs of storage. Now, I know what you're saying. Didn't I say a minute ago not to spend money on, it, on Apple storage? Yes, I did. But stop at 512. And there's a really important reason for that. The 13 inch MacBook Airs and also the 15 inch with 256 gigs of storage on it, they only use a single NAND chip. That's why I suggested jumping up to the 15 inch and the 512 gig model, because then, then you're getting two storage chips for faster read write speeds. They'll have better memory swap in case your Mac should run low on physical RAM. They'll also be, it'll be longer lasting because there's more internal space on it as well. And don't forget, as SSDs get nearer to capacity, they begin to suffer and slow down because they, well, they suffer from performance throttling. So by going for that 15 inch 512 model, you're actually future-proofing yourself. You're buying a MacBook Air that is so good. And don't forget, use those Thunderbolt 4 ports and just use more external storage. You've got a Mac that really will see you right for ages and ages to come. And another little detail is when you buy that, that MacBook Air that I've just described, you actually get a dual USB-C charging brick as well, which funnily enough, comes in super handy. If you're using this while you're away in a hotel room or an Airbnb, having that second port to charge from is super, super handy. But importantly, Getting back to the point that I made earlier in the video about not trying to make the MacBook Air into something that it's not, the model I've just described, 15 inch, 512 gigs of storage, is going to cost 1,400 pounds. And that is 200 pounds less than the basic entry level 14 inch MacBook Pro. So you're still very much in the MacBook Air territory. And that's important. You're not wasting your money. If you were to go and put 32 gigs of memory on a MacBook Air and two terabytes of SSD storage, you'd be looking at 2,200 pounds. Don't do that. At that point, you may as well go and look at a MacBook Pro. Stay in lane, recognize what the MacBook Pro is great at, and buy the right MacBook Air for you. I really hope you've enjoyed my little sit down and, and catching up with MacBook Air. It's ages since we've spoken about it. I've been using it these past few weeks, and I just thought I wanted to share my thoughts with you and help you buy the right MacBook Air. Now, it's been a few weeks since I've asked you to subscribe. If you're enjoying these videos, it really does help the channel out. We've had some good growth recently. And if you're enjoying these videos, subscribing makes a huge difference to me. Don't forget, if you want to get involved with the channel, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Every single Sunday afternoon, I send out a behind the scenes newsletter telling you what's going on. There's some exciting news. I'm going off to CES in January as well. I've been talking about that in my newsletters. All you need to do is leave me your details on my website, talkingtechandaudio.com. And we've also got our own Discord server as well. So you can get involved with the chat during the week with other like-minded Apple nuts as well. And if you've enjoyed me talking about the MacBook Air in this video and giving you some suggestions of how to buy the right MacBook Air for you, then there's a video on screen right now where I talk to you about why I always end up coming back to a MacBook Air.